Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Energy, Economy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, I'd ask everyone to turn electrical devices to silent. We've received apologies from committee member Jamie Halko Johnston. And we'll come straight to agenda item one now, which is a, a video conference on the Scottish National Investment Bank bill with Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who is director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at the University College of London, and is also a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers. She is joined by Laurie McFarlane, who's the head of patient finance at the UCL Institute, uh, again at the University College London. So welcome to both of you this morning by video link. And uh, perhaps I could start with a, a question to you, Professor Mazzucato, and that is, you, you of course have been involved in the Scottish Government Council um, the plan advisory group. Are you satisfied that all 21 recommendations of the implementation plan have been adequately reflected in the bill that this committee is considering? Um, I mean, to be, I'm going to be extremely frank. I'm not as familiar with the bill as I probably should be, but I'm, I'm quite satisfied in the process that has been in place. So we were just in Scotland and we did a masterclass with the bank. We spoke to them especially about some of the issues that um, arise when one has a mission-oriented public bank versus just a normal public bank. There's many public banks in the world and many of them are part of the problem, not the solution. Uh, they end up just being handout machines. So the question is, you know, how are these missions set? How can you also really use the full power of uh, government instruments from procurement to grants to be part of the fueling of these multiple solutions to actually uh, uh, achieve a mission. But you know, Scotland is a place that is very well set to have a mission-oriented bank because you actually have certain things in place like the Scottish National Performance Framework, which can be very important for uh, devising the metrics to actually know over a period of time whether the bank is actually doing its job. You need metrics that are about additionality making sure that it's making things happen that otherwise would not have happened, as opposed to just taking the place of the private sector when it's not doing its job. But maybe, um, uh, Laurie, do you wanna say something about whether you think the bill itself reflects? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I would say on, on that is that obviously I think the, the implementation plan recommendations covered a lot of different areas, including um, not just in terms of setting up an institution, but also what it will be doing once it is set up. And, and then, therefore, um, I, I, you know, naturally not everything that was in the implementation plan is necessarily something that, would, um, that you would expect to see in a, in a bill establishing the institution necessarily. Submissions to this committee um, on it. So I'll turn to Andy Whiteman now, who has some questions about some of the uh, points raised in those submissions. Uh, thank you very much uh, and welcome. Uh, Laurie, as you rightly say, the implementation plan is uh, about the establishment and uh, development of the bank, but we are, of course, considering the bill, and one of the things that's put into statute uh, are the objects uh, of the bank in Section 2. Uh, and we've had people say that these are rather too um, uh, vague. Um, and, for example, the main object is giving financial assistance to commercial activities for the purpose of promoting or sustaining economic development or employment in Scotland. And I'm just wondering whether you think that should be the main objective of the bank, particularly reference to the word commercial. I'm aware of uh, Professor Matsukato's you know, work in this area where a lot of investment by the state has not been into commercial things, but things that later became commercial. So have you got any comments on the bank's objects as set out in the bill? Should I just respond and then you can add to it? When we came up to Scotland, um, when was it, uh, a couple months ago, to talk about uh, you know, the details of how the bank should actually be set up, that came up. And we recommended that it be worded in the way that it's actually worded in our nice little red book, <laughs> um, which is to provide patient finance to those organizations in the public, private, and third sector, so in civil society, that are willing to engage with the government missions. 
And I think I would stand behind that. I think it, it really narrows the scope to use the word commercial, both for the reasons that you mentioned, because commercial is also a dynamic, kind of the commercial dynamic is that, you know, you might have, uh, you know, the, the process of investing in one area sometimes turns up in another area. The classic example, by the way, is Viagra, <laughs> which was not meant to do what it's currently doing. It was actually for heart. That is a typical result from innovation. The, the search for one thing leads to the discovery of something else, but that's more an issue of serendipity. But the other issue is in terms of the organizational context, there's really no reason to say that this is just for private uh, lending, you know, for the private sector. Of course, it should fuel uh, investment in the private sector, and this is the whole issue of crowding in, both you know, in the United Kingdom in general, there's pretty low private investment. So having these ambitious forms of patient, long-term, committed, mission-oriented finance, historically, when it's devised strategically, ends up increasing the expectations of the business sector of where the future opportunities lie. And I think that's the key role of this bank, which is to provide more direct, not indirect finance in mission-oriented areas, which actively create a new landscape, which then increase business investment afterwards because they actually desire, you know, it, it, it pains called it animal spirits are created in that process. Okay, thank you very much uh, indeed. You mentioned your paper, which I, I, I have here. I wasn't clear. I mean, I'm clear that what you're saying is you think that the objects of the bank should be focused on the mission. That's great. I'm not clear whether in this document you actually give some text um, but it, on what page it is. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering, I know you're a busy person, um, but if you have any thoughts about how the objects could be framed in general terms yeah. that might improve in the bill, the committee, I'm sure, would be very keen to hear that. Well, so I'm not sure if you're asking where the missions are set or the degree to which the loans um, then go only to private or other forms of uh, organizations. I think there's, those are two separate questions. So what we say in the document is that, you know, the challenges, which are much broader than missions, are really set by government. Then you need something like a mission board or mission agencies. This is exactly what we're currently working with Greg Clark uh, here in Westminster, what is the organizational form where the missions themselves get set? Personally, I don't think that would should happen inside the bank. That should really be a cross-departmental area. So for example, if you have a clean growth mission, sorry, challenge, turning that into a mission that has to do with refurbishing both new and old buildings, but really thinking about also design and sustainable cities, that requires this cross-sectoral, cross-actor, cross-disciplinary investment. And the role of the bank is to fuel that patient finance towards those organizations that are willing to engage in that mission. That's why we say you pick the willing, you don't pick the winners. Okay, thank you. Um, Jackie Bailey. Good morning to both of you. The policy memorandum accompanying the bill um, says quite clearly that the bank will only lend to the private sector, which is something you've already touched on. Now, my understanding is that's because um, it's solely capitalised initially by financial transaction money, which can only be used for um, private businesses up until 2021. Notwithstanding that, given that government money will come thereafter, um, do you think that simply limiting it to the private sector is just too narrow and restrictive? Um, and would you include, for example, social enterprises, cooperatives in the third sector? My answer is definitely yes. Now, um, hopefully, I'm not creating problems there. But, um, Laurie. Yeah, just said. just to clarify, Zal, because we did raise this issue again when we were up in Edinburgh, yeah. and our own our understanding maybe this um, maybe we're we're not remembering correctly, but we thought I thought we got a clarification, which yeah. was that what that actually meant was everything apart from the public sector, so that, that it did actually include social enterprises and, and charities, etc. Um, but but maybe that, you know, don't, don't quote us completely on that. That was certainly my understanding of the yeah. response. So in the panel that we had, uh, there were some questions about that in the audience, and that was the reply that was um, given by the bank. And, and we would encourage that. I mean, it does make sense that the public sector doesn't lend to the public sector. <laughs> um, that can just be done through a transfer <laughs> between departments. But to be using the bank to provide patient, long-term committed, 
mission-oriented finance to organizations in both the private and social enterprise and other types of third sector institutions is absolutely important given that today in the modern age, many of the problems that are out there, if you think of both the energy challenge and the health challenge globally are in fact being invested in by you know, philanthropies, by public institutions, by private institutions, by civil society organizations. So that's what you wanna be doing. You wanna be fueling these multiple solutions towards solving problems across different actors. We call it a cross-sectoral, cross-disciplinary, cross-actor investment process. Thank you. We would much. encourage you to, to keep provoking on that. We can area. do that. <laughs> Uh, good morning. I appreciate your time uh, this morning. I'd like to follow up on the discussion of the bank's uh, top-level mission statements. Mission statements are obviously uh, in their objectives uh, top level, but how can we ensure there is sufficient demand in the economy to access the finance to be provided by the bank? Because we've heard from other witnesses that on the demand side of the equation, there is a question mark over whether there is enough demand in the economy for long-term patient capital. So I'd like to get your views on how the bank can stimulate uh, the demand side of the equation. So that is an, a fundamental question you're asking, and it's a really smart one, if I can say so. In academia, uh, researchers often don't understand that. We often pretend that there's a financing gap you might have heard that word, financing gap, or sometimes we even talk about a, a credit crunch. That's false. There's plenty of finance out there. There's just often two other problems. There's not enough quality finance, so patient long-term finance, and that's what the bank will provide, but there's often not enough demand for the finance. You definitely see this in the small, medium enterprise space. There's not enough small, medium enterprises that even want to innovate, that want to grow. There's lots of status quo uh, behavior. And so coming back to my point before about crowding in, if the bank, but not alone, the bank alone will not be able to do anything. This has to be seen as an instrument across what we would call investment-led growth strategies. We shouldn't forget that the UK is a part of the world that continues to grow through consumption-led growth, not investment-led growth, so that private debt to disposable income is back at record levels to what it was just before the crisis. So transforming a consumption led to an investment led growth strategy, the question is, is there that desire to invest or is there a demand side problem as you're saying? And if the bank is structured in the way that we recommend it to be, which is not just a handout machine, right? Just handing out money to whichever a sector, a business or any kind of organization that asks for it, but it's much more targeted towards solving the, what we call societal challenges framed in this mission-oriented way, if it does it in an ambitious way, then evidence shows us historically that this crowds in private finance, right? Because this has been the problem in many countries that when you use indirect incentives like tax incentives or guarantees and subsidies, that assumes the private sector already wants to invest. And if they don't want to invest, all that does is increase their profits. And there's no profits problem, there's an investment problem. So by increasing the imagination and the perception of the business community that there's an exciting new future of mobility, clean growth, aging society kind of mission that they can get involved in and there will be long-term profits in the area, but they have sort of uh, an aid to get in that space through this patient finance uh, instrument that ideally if structured in ways that we advise, will crowd in that form of business uh, investment. And if, if I could maybe just add to, to that quickly, I think this is why the bank has the potential to be very different to other instruments that have been developed in Scotland over the years. So for example, the, I think it was the, the, the growth scheme, the Scottish growth scheme, which was effectively a kind of SME financing instrument that was just there and, and it didn't provide any directionality or that kind of, you know, that 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 directionality that mission oriented bank will do. And as I understand it, there was struggle to get to get take up of it because you know there was it was just an instrument that was saying, well, yes, you can come, you can get this kind of subsidized credit. Whereas the whole point of a mission oriented bank is to provide to catalyze those animal spirits in the way that Mariana just described, uh, in order to get to, to to work with those out there who are willing and able and excited to invest in the key areas of the future, rather than just sitting back and saying, well, there's this instrument, come and take it. But, you know, this should be seen in association with a portfolio of different instruments, of which the bank is just one. 
So we would really recommend that in order to have the full effect of this crowding in process that you're basically asking about, that we also really think through changes in how procurement policy works um, and other such instruments, which currently actually stifle innovation, don't uh, nurture that kind of bottom-up solutions towards solving you know, things that government actually needs, whether it's building hospitals or schools. So just thank you very much for that. What, one supplemental question. In some respects, the success of the bank will therefore depend on the interaction with other agencies to, which will help in stimulating that demand and will also have to be part of a restructuring of the enterprise landscape in Scotland by the sounds of it. Absolutely. So we've been talking closely even with your um, organisation called CivTech, for example, which is very interesting because it's all about thinking how the welfare state itself, how it's structured, can be a funnel through which innovation happens. Currently, there's this myth that you have the kind of Silicon Valley kind of parts of a country, you know, whether it's actually Silicon Valley or Sil Silicon Roundabout or whatever any country calls it. And that wealth and value that's created gets kind of handed out to citizens through whatever arm, whether it's the welfare state, uh, through a redistribution of taxation, or just kind of, again, a, hand, a handout to the citizens. The idea is how can you also make Scotland a really interesting laboratory for reimagining healthcare, uh, thinking about, um, you know, again, a sustainable city, but also regions, which then becomes a funnel through which innovation happens. So you don't have this dichotomy of the welfare state and innovation, you really kind of bring them together. And I think from my perception, Scotland is having really interesting conversations about that. And I would kind of scale up the sound of those conversations that they become one of the places also where these missions are both set, but also managed. Thank you. Donald. Thanks very much, Karina. Good morning. Um, the bank is going to be uh, funded by £200 million a year investment by the Scottish Government. How does that level of capitalisation compare with other development banks in the UK, like the Development Bank of Wales or the British Banking uh, Business Bank? The really important issue, I think, is not so much right now but the amount of money, it's the level of flexibility with it. So the two billion, which has actually been allocated in terms of an initial capitalization, is absolutely central that they have the so-called dispensation effect where you can really turn it over year by year. Um, so you can actually do long-term planning. The whole point of having a, a patient long-term bank is it can actually plan in a long-term way. If every year you're fearful that the unspent funds disappear, go back to the treasury, it's going to be impossible for the bank to do its job. It's, it's actually a really critical issue. And that, I would say, matters more than, you know, how much does the actual amount compared to another bank. But, Lori, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, just on the capitalization amounts, so over the 200 million a year, building up to 2 billion, um, in terms of comparatively across the other institutions you mentioned in the UK, but also internationally, in terms of capitalization itself, um, is, 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 is very, I think, pretty reasonable if you look at the, the two billion total relative to GDP versus other European institutions, which is analysis that we, we did in, in one of our papers, it, it, is, um, it is broadly you know, similar in terms of scale. What is different, of course, in, in other places is the ability, therefore, to leverage that capital by borrowing and issuing bonds, et cetera. And that's where the, that's where the difference might lie, at least in the initial phase. So g given that level of... Um investment of £2 billion over the 10 years. Are you satisfied that we will be able to manage and get the desired impact we require? And then initially, should the bank have a narrow focus uh, until it grows to a reasonable size? I mean, we've had various uh, comments about there should only be one mission statement, so there should be a whole range of mission statements. What should the focus be at the beginning to get a desired impact on the economy? So one of the important aspects of the missions as we frame them and how we're currently working, for example, here in Westminster with the notion of a mission-oriented industrial strategy is that it's the framing of the mission, again, matters more than how many missions do you have. Think of a cancer mission if it's just about the health sector as opposed to bringing in all the preventative areas, it will be much more narrow. So if you had even one mission in Scotland or sorry, one big challenge around, say, clean growth, 
And then you thought through a mission, which again, we can't, you know, that's not our role to devise a mission for you, but some sort of process across society where you formulate a mission that would require lots of different sectors um, and different types of actors and multiple projects being funded bottom up, that will have a much bigger effect on the economy than if you have maybe three narrow missions. So I would say as long as it's really a cross-sectoral mission, then a mission framing in the first instance may be really focusing on whether it's future mobility or clean growth or again, something around health, but the framing of it, so it really involves lots of different sectors, that's what I would advise. And so taking that first almost experiment of, of a first mission with the bank really seriously, um, you know, when, when we use the word moonshot, going to the moon and back again in a generation, which of course is the 50th year uh, that's being celebrated across the world, uh, this year um, required like 12 different sectors. It wasn't just aeronautics. It was also investments in nutrition, investments in textiles, mat materials. You couldn't eat a hamburger and wear jeans and a t-shirt up in the moon. And so that's what we mean. And also there was like 300 different projects that got us there, of which most failed. And so that willingness to, sorry, it's Victoria, the, that willingness to take risks and to experiment um, is really important. And so the way that the bank, again, understands risk, failure, but also doesn't just socialize risks, but also socializes rewards, those issues are really, really key to get right. So I would agree that maybe formulating an initial mission that's really cross-sectoral to work out some of these complications would make sense. So learning by doing. Yeah, and maybe just, just one thing to add to that, if possible. Um, Obviously, the, the benefits of, a, of an institution like this is, is not just about the volume of investment, which is obviously important, or the rate of investment. It's about the direction of investment. I think the key thing for the first, um, for the success of the bank, is to make sure that it is doing things that wouldn't otherwise happen. I think there is a risk that if in the initial phases the bank is set up and thinks, so we just want some quick wins, let's just shovel money into this thing here that was probably going to happen anyway. Yeah. And it's not generally generating that kind of additionality, which is really the kind of point of the bank. So I think that you really want to focus on making sure that that money that is there, which would be much better if there was more, it's always better if there was more, but within the money that is there, that is making sure that it's used in a way which is actually generating that additionality. Isn't just making, isn't just kind of, you know, giving money to things that would have happened anyway, if we were honest about it. And many different policies do that. Many failed policies uh, just basically are, you know, um, taking the place of something that would have happened. The example I often give is the patent box policy, which was lobbied for by the pharmaceutical industry, reduces government uh, revenue, but doesn't actually create a net increase in the investment of the pharmaceutical industry, it just raises their profits. SME financing, it might be fine for folkloric reasons, but there's very little evidence that it increases net job creation, unless you really uh, uh, direct that finance to the kind of 6% of SMEs that are even trying to innovate and invest more in you know, new areas. So how you devise the instruments really, really matters. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Convener. Um, Professor, the, the, the mission statement states that missions must be widely perceived to be legitimate uh, and of high societal importance. And obviously this is to ensure they survive the political changes that inevitably happen from time to time. How should the Scottish Government and the bank ensure that the missions are legitimate and of high societal importance? Okay, again, that's a really important question because the moonshot was very top down. It might have been inspirational. It did all these great things. Everything in our smart products basically is a spillover from that era, but it was top down. It was the Kennedy machine. Whereas one thing that we um, often highlight is that recently in the German uh, situation, the Energie Wende mission that they have, which is really cross sectoral, it's led to the steel industry transforming itself through repurpose, reuse, recycle, lowering its material content, that would never have happened without the green movement, which for 30 years fought for bringing sustainability to the fore of the political discourse. So what we are currently, again, doing in our missions work across the world, including with the UN, is trying to think through, does the public sector have the capability, the capacity, the training 
that I would call empathy 101, which is how do you actually engage with movements? How do you listen? How do you not fear conflict? How do you create safe spaces for debate? Which I think is almost the definition of a public space, a place where you're safe to contest. And so we have, for example, Charlie Ledbetter in the Institute write a paper for us called Movements Behind Missions. And so if you think about the different uh, movements out there around social care, around, of course, the climate crisis, bringing those voices to, you know, around the table in a genuine, not tokenistic way in order for these missions to be set with different voices is really important. And this would include trade unions. Globally, trade unions, labor unions are thinking about things like what's called the just transition. And it's all about, you know, if you move from a fossil fuel based economy to one based on clean energy, widely understood to be not just about energy, but again, how we think about uh, production, distribution, and consumption, some workers will be left behind. Now, that way of thinking, even though I completely support it, it's kind of too late. Those trade unions should be at the table in the first place when we think about the green transition. There should be public actors, private actors, uh, uh, social enterprises that you were talking about before, civil society organizations, at the table thinking about the missions. And that's much easier said than done, but I would argue that that's really important in order to also bring resilience, not just legitimacy, resilience to these missions so they're not easily uh, you know, wiped away when a new minister comes on board and wants his or her pet project to be Mission X. Clearly you're uh, talking about finding a means to engage civic society in uh, prioritizing these matters that are of high societal importance. Is the proposed advisory group the right vehicle for that? Would it be effective in that? Can it be effective in that? Well, who's on the advisory group would really matter because it, 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 you can't bring hundreds of people around the table, but making sure that those who are around the table are genuinely representing different voices in a non-idiosyncratic way. It can't be, oh, let's bring together, you know, Siemens and, um, and then a pharmaceutical company and a digital kind of high-tech cool little SME and some public and civil society actors here and there. They should ideally be representing different types of voices each. So if you had a care mission, making sure you had, you know, uh, uh, social care workers and nurses at the table would be, you know, obvious to me. But again, this is something I think that really has to be decided by your political process. Um, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about the advisory group? Yeah, and the other thing is just to make sure that um, if they, if they, when the advisory group is set up, that it is not that it is not seen to just be tokenistic in the sense that it's there to provide that that kind of cover of this without having any real meaningful um, um, kind of agency to, to to shape things. So I think that. The, certainly, the, 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 ra the rationale for the advisory group in the implementation plan, I think, was um, the right one, was about how do you bring in this, this uh, wider voices into the process of setting the missions. But I think the devil will be in the detail of how that actually operates and functions as to whether it's something that is, that, that is meaningful and is, is not seen to be simply tokenistic, I think. Oh, yeah. And especially in an era of populism, I think it's important to consider that people feel really not just left behind economically, there's plenty of statistics on that, but in the political process, you know, that it's caught down this notion of the elite, uh, whether it's academic elite or business elite or government elite, this could be an opportunity for rethinking how we run democracies. And again, Scotland being at the fore of experimenting in that process. It's hard, by the way, there's no blueprint for this, but you know, that should be seen as, as something quite exciting and being willing to learn from your mistakes you might mess up along the way. As long as you have a process of learning by doing and what are the milestones where you stop. One of the most mission-oriented agencies in the history of capitalism was you know, the kind of DARPA type agency in the US. It wasn't only good at funding innovation, it was also very good at knowing when to turn the tap off. Knowing when to turn the tap off is- Cato, I'm conscious, I'm conscious of time, so we have a number of members of the committee would like to ask questions as well. So apologies for interrupting you at that point on that example, but um, I'd just like to try and get these uh, other uh, questions in, if we may. Um, first of all, Tom Mason. Well, th thank you, Professor. Um, 
you recommend that the investment should be done in an ethical way. What do you mean by that? Well, as, as I mentioned, what's nice about uh, your um, <laughs> country is that you have Scotland's national performance framework. So making sure that you have ways to translate this framework into targets through which you would measure this concept of additionality, right? We talk about additionality, making sure things happen that wouldn't have happened anyway. Well, those things might be bad things. <laughs> um, just making things happen in and of itself is not a good thing. Trump's wall <laughs> is additionality. It wasn't happening before he came along. So making sure that these new things that are being stimulated by the bank's activity, which crowd in private finance, are also meeting the goals that the country has set itself through the National Performance Framework, which um, you, you, you might remember looks very much like the Sustainable Development Goals uh, you know, color chart, but turns it into a macroeconomic target setting. The more you can work on this to make it real, the better. Okay, thank you. So I would say ethical in that sense. I mean, otherwise ethical is up to someone's opinion. We have different ethics, different morals, but having concrete metrics through which you judge whether you're, you're achieving your objectives around inclusive growth, sustainable growth, which have concrete targets, that's what we mean. Thank you. Um, we'll come to John Mason now. If, thanks, Convener. And yes, following on from the point you just made um, about monitoring and monitoring frameworks, um, my understanding is that you're suggesting that the monitoring frameworks should be dynamic eh, and not too fixed. But I mean, is, the, is, the, is it possible for the public sector to do that? Because the public sector likes measuring things that are easy to measure. Yeah, well, one of the, now I don't want to, how do you say, trump our own horn too much, but one of the reasons I set up this institute at UCL, Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, is precisely because I personally do not think that the public sector globally has these capabilities. Uh, if, if you look at how the Treasury, the Green Book, you know, which, which is used to evaluate public investments, it continues to be very much determined by net present value and cost benefit type calculations, which really would have stopped any mission from day one. You know, the moonshot would never have happened had they done a cost benefit analysis of it. But that doesn't mean you have no metrics. So having more dynamic efficiency versus allocative efficiency kind of metrics is something we're working very closely with the Treasury with here. We have a workshop tomorrow, um, coincidentally. But also, when I said knowing when to turn the tap off, you want to be long term. But you might realize, you know, halfway through that it's just not working. You're not getting anywhere. You should know how to pivot, how to question your, you know, uh, behavior and why it is that things are succeeding. And it might have to be, you know, flexible, adaptable. And those are skills, though. If you go to any business school, managers are trained to be flexible, adaptable, to think out of the box. We really need to think through the curriculum, the training for civil servants to think in a mission-oriented way, to act. Thank you. And uh, finally, Angela Constance. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Professor. I wondered if you had any views about the bank's uh, remuneration policy. Committee has received evidence. Some people are arguing that uh, terms and conditions should be on a par uh, with uh, the public sector, civil service. Uh, other people are arguing that uh, the remuneration packages should be on a par with uh, the Edinburgh financial uh, services sector. So I just wondered what your thoughts were. So I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, but again, there's no blueprint for this. But you know, one of, so I've been working on this concept of missions for more than a decade. And one of the things I used to write about was that there's this concept of mission mystique, it's an honor to work for a mission-oriented agency. When Obama had his uh, post-crisis fiscal stimulus of 800 billion, he said he was gonna have a mission to use that to really uh, create a green economy. And he was able to bring in a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, to direct the Department of Energy. And he thought it was an honor to do that. He left Stanford University. It wasn't to create a carbon tax or to simply come in and to fix a market failure. It was to help the government kind of really have a transition. So we, we need to remember that because that, if, if you really are a mission-oriented bank, I believe you will attract people who you know, want to make a difference in the world. Having said that, if you pay them peanuts, you won't. <laughs> so I don't think you need to match the, what I find often absurd salaries in the banking sector, 
but I also don't think you're going to attract you know, people who really have that investment in sectoral and scientific expertise if you're underpaying them. And unfortunately, many public sector workers, I would argue, are underpaid, but we don't have to go into that. That would be a whole other uh, conversation. But I guess the answer is you don't have to match the banker's salaries, but you do then have to make sure that the remit of the bank is really ambitious, is it can be an honor to work inside that bank. And historically, that has served quite well in bringing in high-level expertise to government organizations. What I was talking about before is when you have a curriculum, a training of public servants, which is wed to this idea that you're just there to fix a market failure, well, would you rather go take risks and be a creative actor creating value or just facilitating, enabling, and fixing market failures? You probably choose the first. So we need to reframe what the public sector is for to really attract some of the top you know, talent that we have in our societies. Okay, thank you. Um, and the bank is a good way to do that. Sorry, you're wanting a, a perhaps no. to make one last point? No, I, I was just saying the bank is a wonderful experiment in Scotland precisely to see what it's like to transform our imagination of what the public sector is for. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mazzucato and Laurie McFarlane. Um, we'll conclude this session there. Thank you. Um, item two on our agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three, four, five, and six in private. Are we agreed to do so? Yes. Thank you. In that case, I will suspend the meeting and move to private session.